Uh, so uh, this is a lecture for my first hour U.S. history class on the 31st of March. Um, well, the last time we talked, we uh, Woodrow Wilson had just been reelected president. And, you know, Wilson was never popular. He was no Teddy Roosevelt. One of the greatest political assets that Teddy Roosevelt had was that he, the people liked him. Even his enemies liked him. Well, Wilson wasn't that way. He wasn't very popular, nor was he very beloved by the American people like Teddy Roosevelt was. So when he won in 1916, he barely won. He won by making promises to both sides. The country's divided into pro-war Americans, meaning Americans like Teddy Roosevelt who say we ought to go to war uh, in this world war, and anti-war Americans who say no way. We should no, not get involved in this war. And to win, uh, you know, uh, Wilson, and he barely won. He, he won the state of California by 3,500 votes. If 3,500 people would have voted the other way, uh, he would have lost. So he barely wins. Uh, and he had to siphon off votes from both sides. He had to get votes from the anti-war people. And, and he did that by saying, we're neutral. We're neutral. We're not going to get involved in this war. And he had to get votes from the, the pro-war faction. And to do that, he in, in sent bills to increase the size of the Army and Navy. He tried to arm the uh, merchant ships, and that failed. But anyway, to the pro-war people, and, and he had these gigantic uh, preparedness parades. And to the pro-war people, Wilson looked as if he was, you know, getting the country ready to go to war. So I guess he siphoned up uh, enough votes from both sides to win, but when he did. Uh, well, by 1970, so Wilson uh, wins in November of 1916. Uh, by 1917, by 1917, uh, in Europe, the war uh, had turned very bad. Uh, both sides were losing. Uh, they were slugging it out on the Western Front, uh, and both sides were teetering on the brink of defeat. And, of course, the Allies were hoping against hope that the Americans would come into the war uh, and enable them to win the war. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, said, we've got to get this war, we've got to end this war before the Americans can, e if the Americans decide to come in, we've got to end this war before the Americans can even come in. And so the Germans announced in 1917 that they were going to resume unrestricted unrestric submarine warfare. They had promised in 1915, after the sinking of the Lusitania, that they would not do that, but now they announced that they would. And when they announced that they would, they knew that the United States, they knew that this would bring the United States into the war. But their plan was, we'll start this unrestricted submarine warfare uh, in 1917. The Americans will declare war, but by the time they train an army, raise an, uh, raise an army, train an army, equip an army, build ships to send the army over here, it'll take them a year and the war will be over. And that almost happened. That was the German plan. And it almost happened. We don't get troops on the ground, or what do they call it today? Boots on the ground. We declare war. And I'm going to talk about this in just a moment. You don't have to write this down now. But we declare war on April 3rd, 1917. And we don't get really troops on the ground until April of 1918. Uh, uh, barely. Just barely in the nick of time. So the Germans almost <clears throat> won, won this war. And when the Germans announced, as we said yesterday, and when the Germans announced that they were going to resume uh, unrestricted sinking ships without warning in 1917, I told you that Wilson broke diplomatic relations. Didn't I say that? Did we talk about that? Yeah, yeah. he brought our ambassador home and sent their ambassador home. It's no big deal today. It happens quite regularly today. But in 1917, if you kicked the nation's ambassador out and you recalled your ambassador, that was the final step just before war. And then, of course, the British, get this down, the British who are hoping against hope. The British uh, in February of 1917, okay, remembering we're going to declare war in April, in February, about eight or ten weeks before we declared war, the British handed Woodrow Wilson in the White House, a top secret telegram, and there you see it right there. Uh, there it is as it was sent. There it is in code, and the British had managed to decipher it, and there it is. And we'll get to that in just a moment. 
But this was a message, get this down, sent from the German government to the Mexican government. From the German government to the Mexican government. Uh, I think the Germans had an ambassador in Mexico City. He handled this whole thing. His name was Arthur Zimmerman. And so this telegram is called the Zimmerman. Get this down. The Zimmerman telegram or the Zimmerman telegram or sometimes you see either one called the Zimmerman note. And here it is. And I'll try to read it. It's a little fuzzy. But there it is. That's how the British intercepted it. And then their cryptologist uh, decoded it. And so I'll read it to you. This is from, this is from Germany to Mexico. <clears throat> By the way, how were Mexican-American relations in 1917? How were, we, how were the Mexicans getting along with us and how were we getting along with the Mexicans in 1917? Not that, not, huh? not that good. We are not that good. What 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 was going? You know what had happened? What's that? I don't remember his name. Pancho Villa. Yeah. yeah, remember Pancho Villa in 1916 and invaded the United States and did we sent and burned part of Columbus and we sent an army. We had, we still had soldiers. You know there were people at in 1916 in the U S government talking about going to war with Mexico. And I'm sure there were people in the Mexican government talking about going to war. So this so is not good at all. So at this point, get this down, the Germans having restarted submarine warfare, knowing the United States is going to come into the war. At this point, the Germans sent this message to Mexico and it said, and I quote, we intend to begin. This is from Germany to Mexico. Remember that we intend to begin on the 1st of February, unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event that this is not successful, we make Mexico, we Germans make Mexico uh, a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together. Generous financial support and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, in Arizona. Uh, the settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president, this is the president of Mexico, of the uh, above, most secretly, as soon as outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain, and add the suggestion that he should, on his own in initiative, the president of Mexico, should invite Japan uh, to immediate something. And at the same time, I can't read it. Anyway, I'll stop there. Well, it. Please call the, the president, your president, Mexican president's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of forcing England in a few months to make peace. The Zimmerman telegram. So look, here's what this said, get this down. Uh, the German government is writing to the Mexican government and said, if the United States goes to war against Mexico, what, excuse me, goes to war against Germany, what do we want Mexico to do? Have what? Have well, but you're a little more specific than that. What, what are they specifically asking Mexico to do? Attack. Attack who? Attack who? Uh, invade the United States. Very good. Get that down. Look, tie the U.S. Look, look at this. Tie the U.S. Army down here on the Mexican border so the U.S. Army cannot be sent to Europe. You understand? Uh, yes? You understand that? Good. Okay. Everybody understand that. They're asking Mexico to invade the United States. And at the same time, they're saying, ask Japan to help you and to attack the United States. And if you will tie up the U.S. Army on the Mexican border so that they can't come to Europe when the war is over, we guarantee you that Mexico will get back all of the territory it lost in the Mexican War. The United States and Mexico fought a war from 1846 to 1848. And look at this. <clears throat> this was Mexico. Look at that. All, Mexico ran all the way from Colombia all the way to what is today Washington State. All of the California, all of this was Mexico. 
And at the end of the Mexican War, uh, in the treaty that ended the Mexican War, a treaty called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States seized half of Mexico. It cut Mexico in half, all that territory there. That's called, the, in the history, the Mexican Cession. And what the Germans are saying to the Mexicans, if you will invade and attack the United States and keep them from sending their army to Europe, when the war is over, we will give you that back. Mexico will get all of that back. Okay, you understand the Zimmerman telegram? Yes, you understand what they're saying? Yes. Talk to me. Yes. Talk to me. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Open your mouth yeah. and speak. Bob, yeah, yeah, okay, good. I don't know what this it must be too early in the morning. You're burst of talking or something. Anyway, uh, so the uh, um, Mexicans are encouraged to make war against the United States. Uh, and, and, of course, that's Germany's plan to win the war. Well, this was handed to Wilson. Get this down. This was handed to Wilson in the White House by the British. And the British had had this a while. But they're waiting for just the right time. And they walk in and hand that to Wilson, and he read it. And he crushed it and said, this means war, okay? Well, that was in February of 1917. Uh, let's go to March of 1917, okay? Blow by blow here. Right now, March of 1917. In March of 1917, and I'm just going to make this real short, four American merchant ships were sunk by German submarines. Four American merchant ships were sunk by German submarines. And when those four ships were sunk, got this down. I want you to remember this date. On April 3rd, April 3rd, <clears throat> April 3rd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson became the first American president to appear before the Congress. He's not the first to ask the Congress for war. Thomas, uh, excuse me, James Madison in 1812 asked the Congress for war, but he didn't go over there. He just sent a message. Uh, James K. Polk asked the uh, Congress for war in 1846, but he didn't go over there. He just sent a message. But Woodrow Wilson appears in, purpose, in person. There he is in the House of Representatives with all the Senate and all the House members there. And Wilson asked the Congress to declare war. And I want you to know why. Get this down. You know, when presidents go to ask the Congress for war, they have, you know, they don't just say, I want war. They have to tell the Congress why they are asking for war. Get this down. And Wilson said for two reasons. He said, I want this to be the war to end all war. If you ever hear that phrase for the rest of your life, the war to end all war. It's World War One. Wilson asked that. He said, we're going to fight this war. And when this war is over, there will be no more war. Well, they sort of failed on that. Uh, and the second reason is, he said, that we are, I'm asking Congress to declare war to make the world safe for democracy. If you ever, to make the world safe for democracy. In other words, to spread democracy across the world. Are we still in the business of doing that? Yeah. Yes, we are. Can you give me an example? Very good. It's good to hear someone's voice. I thought I was in here by myself for a moment. Anyway, uh, can you give me an example of us still in the business in 2022 of spreading democracy? Going into a country to make it a democracy? Any of you think of an example of that? Not, not in 2022. Like, you know, you're, you're not wrong earlier, but, but can you name me as a, an example of us going into a country and making a democracy? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. What do you think we've been doing there? You know, did you miss that the last 20, your whole life? Until this year, we were, your whole life, we were, and even before that, we were in Afghanistan. We're making the world safe for democracy. Get this down. <clears throat> we still have, this is the reason I don't like Woodrow Wilson. He's one of my least favorite presidents. But we still have a Wilsonian foreign policy. We still have a Wil Wilsonian foreign policy. Recently, we have been in Iraq, attempting to make Iraq. We were there for many, many years, attempting to make it 
uh, a democracy failure. By the way, what is this just simply a replay? I want to see if you can think today. What is this simply a replay of that we've talked about, this idea that we spread our ideas across the world? There's another name for that, and we've talked about it. Spread democracy, the English language, the Christian religion. <clears throat> Isn't this just a replay of the 1840s, a thing called Manifest Destiny? We talked about Manifest Destiny. Uh, yes? Speak out. Talk as loud as you do in the hall when I tell you to lower your voice. You scream like banshees out here. And when I ask you a series, you're talking about a bunch of rot out there that nobody cares about. But when I ask you to, to answer a serious question, you just mumble. Uh, manifest destiny. If you think manifest destiny is going away, you don't know the country you're living in. You certainly don't know its foreign policy. And really, you don't know the world. Is uh, Vladimir Putin carrying out a form of manifest destiny? He sure is. Is he trying to force his culture on, among other things, on the Ukraine? He sure is. Yeah, yeah, okay. So anyway, Wilson said we're going to fight to make the world, uh, we're going to fight to make the world uh, safe for democracy. And then after this speech, he went back to the con or went back to the White House, and he sat down in the cabinet room and he laid his head on the table, uh, and he wept. Uh, well, got this down. The country was divided. Well, you know, Wilson is going to lead a divided country into the war. And we've talked about this, so I'm not going to visit much about this. But, you know, see him standing there while he was making that speech. The congressman sitting there and the senators listening to him. There were 1,500 people out on the steps of the Capitol, Capitol essentially chanting, no war, no war, while he's making the war speech. Uh, get this down. Irish Americans, and there were a lot of Irish Americans. And the Irish Americans opposed the war. You know, England owned the Ireland, and the Irish were fighting for their independence. And the last thing they wanted to do was to go into a war on the side on the side of England. Uh, German Americans, get this down. There were millions of German Americans. And by the way, some of these German Americans will leave this country and they will go and fight on the side of Germany. Uh of course, most German Americans were patriotic Americans, and they fought on the side of the United States. In World War II, a lot of Germans are going to leave, and especially in World War II, a lot of Germans are going to leave, and they're going to go over and fight for Hitler. That's hard to understand, but they're going to go over and fight for Hitler. And then there were pacifists. Then there were pacifists who said, then there were pacifists who said, we don't want any war. And then there were isolationists who said, no war. We've been isolated since the beginning of this country. Why ruin that? Why get involved in a European war? Also, there were progressives. Get this down. There were progressives who were against the war. We talked about this the other day, but I'll repeat it. Progressives said, uh, essentially, World War I will kill the progressive movement. Uh, it will take money away that we want to spend on housing the homeless and feeding the hungry and educating the ignorant and clothing the naked and doing all these wonderful things that we want to do. The war will take all that money away. And guess what? The war took all that money away. And guess what? The war killed the progressive movement. But the progressives, the progressives fought against it. Uh, this woman was a, there's a close-up of Wilson, okay, making that same speech. There's a close-up. First time in history a president appeared before the Congress to ask for war. And Lincoln never went and made a speech in front of the Congress, but Wilson does it. Write this woman down, Jeanette Rankin. Jeanette Rankin was a pacifist Republican. Get this down. She's a pacifist. That means she was opposed to violence, including war. Uh, she was the only woman in the Congress at the time. I think there are over 20 women in the Senate right now. I'd have to check that, but I think there are over 20 women in the Senate right now. And she was uh, the only woman in. She had just gotten in the Congress. The very first vote she has to cast, the very first vote she has to cast was whether or not to send this country to Europe to a war. And she was a pacifist and a progressive Republican. And uh, she voted against World War I. The first vote she cast, get that down, she voted against World War I. But now listen to what I'm going to say to you. In the world, she wasn't alone. Get this down. 50 members of Congress. That's never good if a president asks for war. 50 members of Congress voted against this war, and she was one of them. 
They ask her, why did you vote against the war? She's from Montana. You know, Montana, this pistol shooting cowboy country, you know, pretty got a pretty tough reputation. But they send this pacifist woman to Congress and she votes against the war. And they said, Congressman or Congresswoman Rankin, why did you vote against this war? And she said, I am a woman and I can't go. And I'm not going to vote. Since I can't go fight in a war, I'm not going to vote to send someone else's son to die for this war. And by the way, you don't have to have all this down, but 25 years later, the day after Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, she was still in the Congress. And Franklin Roosevelt will go down to the Congress and he will stand where Woodrow Wilson stood. He's the last president to ever do this, by the way. And he asked the Congress for a declaration of war. And in 30 minutes, the Congress voted to go to war against Japan. There was only one vote against it. Who cast the only vote against World War II? She did. She did. And the good people of Montana in the next election voted her out. Okay. But what was the hard? You've got to think about this. You know, we're all, we're, listen, we're all so caught up in the majority in this country. All we want to blather on and on about is the majority rule. And you understand that one definition of history is how many times history is simply a record of how many times the majority has been wrong. You understand the majority elected Hitler. You understand that. You understand the majority crucified Jesus. You understand that. Uh, and on and on we could go. Um, she. So what was the hard vote to cast on December the 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor? Was it easier to, to vote for the war or was it easier to vote against it? For it. But she stood alone. You know, I don't agree with her. If I'd been there sitting in the seat beside her and they'd call my name to stand up and cast my vote, I think we had to go to war against Japan. I would have voted for that. But I'll tell you what, even though she and I disagreed, I would have admired her stance. I admire people who stand by their convictions, as long as they're good convictions. I admire people who stand by their convictions. Because somebody disagrees with you, that doesn't make them evil. I think we've almost reached that point in this point in the country. If you think there should, if you think everybody ought to be able to own any kind of weapon they want, and I say, well, you know, there are certain kind of weapons. Nobody needs an assault rifle. You know, the deer aren't that ferocious. Uh, well, we disagree on that. I don't think that makes you evil. I just think you disagree with me, and I don't think that makes me evil. But we've gotten to the point. You know, one of the one of the greatest things we have in this country that millions, billions in the world don't have the right to do is to disagree. And yet we look down on disagreement. If somebody disagrees with us, they're evil. Hillary Clinton is evil. Donald Trump is evil. Joe Biden is evil. We got to get rid of those people. What baloney. What a misreading of American history. And when people say that to me, I know one thing about those people. They've never read this. That's not exactly true, but they probably never have read that. I would bet my retirement on it. Anyway, Jeanette, and, and I'll just say this about Jeanette Rankin. She gets kicked out of the Congress in 1941, but in the 1960s, she's 88 years old. The Vietnam War is going on, and she actually led a war protest down Pennsylvania Avenue against the Vietnam War. I may disagree with her, and you may disagree with her, or you may agree with her, but I admire her. I think you have to admire her for standing, standing by her convictions. Well, anyway, get this down. Wilson led a divided nation in war. You know, when Roosevelt asked for war 25 years later, they voted in 30 minutes. They voted 30 minutes, uh, one vote against. Wilson, get this down, over 50 members of the Congress voted against the war. Over 50 members of the Congress voted. So Wilson, unlike Franklin Roosevelt, 25 years later, Wilson is going to lead a divided country. And I'm going to tell you something. Of all things that you want the country to be united on, it's when you're going to war. Unity. Unity helps win wars. Well, get this down. As soon as the war was declared then, get this all down. As soon as the war was declared, the government took over the American economy. Write that down. The government took, took over businesses. The populace would have been shouting hallelujah. They took over the railroads. They took over the electric companies. Write this man down. The government's going to take over the economy and they're going to run it for the next four years. Well, for this, not, we're not in the war four years. 
uh, until the war is over. And then they're going to start relinquishing control. But, uh, the first thing that the government does is that it formed a board called the War Industries Board, the War Industries Committee. War, and, and write this man down, Bernard, Bernard Baruch ran the War Industries Board. And he was a, he essentially ran the American economy. He set prices. If you ran a grocery store, he told you how much you could charge for bread, how much you could charge for a gallon of milk, how much you would pay your employees. The government just suggested that we wear masks in the middle of a pandemic, and I thought people were going to jump off a bridge. That, that was taking away their freedom. It's amazing to me. I don't know what they would have done in World War II. And then it only gets worse. If you think the government had control of the economy in World War I, uh, just hang around for World War II. The War Industries Board told farmers what crops they would produce. They didn't ask them. They didn't say, we need wheat this year. Would you please grow it? They said, this is what you're going to produce. As I say, they took over the railroads. Are we on daylight savings? We're not on daylight savings. Are we? Yeah, we are on daylight savings time. I want you to write this down. And we're and they're debating that in the Congress. Uh, I don't know how far it's going to go. I think there are a couple of states that don't do daylight. They just leave the clock the same. Indiana's one of them, I think. They just leave the clock the same all year long. But they're debating up in the Congress whether or not to do away with daylight savings time. Well, what, what's the what's the? Uh, and by the way, they've moved daylight savings time back. And, uh, daylight savings time used to not start until late March, but they've moved it back a month almost. Why are we doing that? What's the purpose of doing that? Why do we have daylight? And by the way, it starts in World War I, daylight savings time. The, government's even, the government is even going to control the clock. Why did we do that? What's the, have you ever thought about that? What's the purpose of daylight savings time? Wasn't that for farming? Huh? For farming? Well, <laughs> the, more, the more daylight there is, the less electricity you use. Yeah, you don't turn on the lamps. I mean, you know, at 8 o'clock at night, you can be sitting and watching the ESPN. It's pretty light outside. You don't need the lamps on, the less electricity you use. See that? And they wanted to conserve electricity. They wanted to conserve electricity. Not just there. By the way, they even, the government, just think about this. The government even regulated the number of stops that an elevator could make in a building. Look at this. If you worked on the... You worked on the fifth floor. Well, let's do this. If you worked on the tenth floor, okay, the tenth floor, the elevator would go up and it might stop on the fifth floor, and you had to walk up five flights of stairs. Uh, or if you uh, walk, uh, worked on on the uh, the tenth floor, if you worked on the fifteenth floor, it would, or, or the tenth floor, it might stop on the fifteenth. And you had to walk down five flights of stairs. But the less stops that it made, the more electricity that was conserved. I mean, the, the, what I'm saying to you is, is the government left no stone unturned so far as conserving energy uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, so um, the War Industries Board. And then write this man down, Herbert Hoover. And there's a big effort to conserve food. The more food we save, the more food there is for the troops. Uh, and uh, Herbert Hoover, write him down. Get used to him because he will, he's the president of the United States when the Great Depression strikes uh, a decade later in 1929. He became the chief food administrator. His job was to make sure that people conserved food. I mean, the government's going to take over here, the ch chief food administrator. And he instituted a thing called Wheatless Mondays. What do you think that was? Write that down. Wheatless Mondays. No wheat on Mondays. Well, wheat in the form of what? Bread. You know, yeah. If you went home tonight and said, gee, mom, what do we have? So, well, you know, we're having wheat. You know, just had your bucket of wheat. Well, you're not a horse. Uh, wheat. He said everybody should not eat bread. Get this down. Everyone should not eat bread on Monday. Take Stop eating bread one day a week, and that's more for the troops. And also meatless Tuesdays. Meatless Tuesdays. Okay. Yeah, don't eat meat one day a week. Yeah. Couldn't hack that. Yeah. Don't eat, don't eat wheat. 
or excuse, don't eat meat on Monday or Tuesday. And that's more for the troops. I want to get the right day here. And by the way, conserving food, and you know, the American people conserving food, it was called Hoover Rising. Hoover Rising. And look, got this down as well. This isn't just, you know, you got to read between the lines. Now, this isn't just an effort to save bread. It is, or to save wheat. It isn't just uh, uh, an effort to save meat, but it is. But get this down. This was to get, listen, this was to get ordinary Americans involved in the war. Look how we fight wars today. What percentage, you know, there are 330 million of us in this country. What percentage of us, what percentage of us uh, are serving the military? How many are right now serving the military? 30%. 30%? Yeah, that's an educated guess. That's not it. Any other guesses? 2%. How much? 2%. 2%? Well, that's an educated guess. That's not it. I was wrong with it. 0.5%. Not even 1%. And they, those people go off to these horrible places, like the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan, and put their life on the line. And what do the rest of us do? Play around, eat potato chips all day. Well, hopefully not, but we could. What kind, of sac what kind of sacrifice did I make in the last 20 years to win the war in Afghanistan? None. Let's do what I always do. I got up and came to school. What kind of sacrifice did you make? I said right in the middle of the war. You know, most, I'm convinced a good number of Americans didn't even know we were at war. Unless you had a brother or a cousin or a son or a daughter over there. That's a real shame that the rest of us slugs do nothing and we send less than 1% of us to take care of the bad guys for us. We ought to be ashamed. Well, Mr. Thompson, there's the problem, you know. We're really, uh, uh, that's about as far as some people's brain will ever go. But yeah, we ought to be ashamed. And Wilson didn't want that to happen. And in World War I, the government said, not just Wilson, we're going to call on every day ordinary Americans to sacrifice. I said in the middle of the Afghan war, I was thinking about, see, this is why I'll never be elected to anything, but I said they ought to put a 50 cent a gallon tax on gasoline. Oh, oh I, see, I see people looking up, 50 cents a gallon. Oh my God, I'll kill. Yeah. And now you're talking, you know, forget all that military stuff fighting over in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah okay. But now when you start talking about raising the price of gasoline, Mr. Thompson, that's really serious stuff. They should have done it. To make us feel a little bit of the pain, not much, but make us feel a little bit of the pain that those men and women who are defending us in this big, dumb, happy country felt. But don't worry, you know, get your blood pressure back down. They're never going to do that. Do you think someone can, running for president could advocate a fit with Wood, Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? Do you think they would ever stand up and say, you know what? I think you, we ought to feel, if we're going to send young men and women to fight all over the world, we ought to feel some of the pain too. So I'm going to propose to the Congress, if you elect me as president of the United States, to put a 50 cent a gallon ga uh, uh, tax on gas. You think anybody would say that? No. No. And do you think if they did, they would be elected? No. That's why they won't say it. That's a pretty pathetic state, in my opinion, that we've come to. Well, look, Wilson said this, if we are going to win this war, Everybody has to participate. Of course, everybody doesn't always participate. You never can say everybody. The more educated you become, there's a little word. You'll use less and less and less and less. And that's the word all. All. Less you'll use that the more. If you talk to somebody and every other word in their vote, they all or we all, you're dealing with an essentially uneducated person. All. You never can say all. But... This, get this down, brought millions of Americans on board. So it's not just about saving food. It is about saving food, but this was an effort to get the American people behind the war. And then here's another one. Get this down. Bonds. Bonds, okay? U.S. savings bonds. U.S. savings bonds. Got this down. The war was funded. How do you? War is the most expensive. Some people are always griping about welfare. Just fight a good war. See how much that costs you. War is the most expensive thing a government does. And uh, 
how do we fight our wars today? Where do we get the money to fight our wars today? Okay. Huh? What? Taxes? No. They don't have enough guts to tax you. They don't want to tick you off. I'm recording this right. I said something else. They don't want to tick you off. So they're not going to come to you raise your taxes for God's sake. Where, so where does the government get the money to fight these wars in Afghanistan for 20 years? I forget how many millions of dollars a day, maybe an hour, we were spending there for 20 stinking years. Where did we get all those trillions of dollars? Did we borrow it? We borrowed it. And the national debt is just going through the roof. But in World War I, get this down, again, to get the American people involved in the war, to support the war, get this down the uh, people were encouraged to buy bonds, right? That, that, you know what a bond is? You know what a savings bond is? Well, let me explain it real quick. And if I make a mistake, I, I've actually bought savings bonds, but I, it's been a long time. If I make a mistake, my esteemed colleague, uh, Mrs. Spears, who uh, majored uh, uh, in economics and uh, finance at uh, BYU, will correct me. But anyway. It's my boys that's a bond. Huh? Do you want to do this? No. Okay. Well, maybe. Okay, come on. <laughs> I'm asking. No, what they cost? Do you remember? Uh, well, I mean, there's different. I'd like to hear this answer before I retire. Different so things values, but like 25 bucks, like okay. with like a minimum okay. one, I think. Uh, okay. Okay. And you can buy a $50. You can go to the bank. There's you can go to any values. bank and you say, I want to buy a $50 U.S. savings bond. Right? Am I right so far? Mm -hmm. And you give them $50. And they give you a bond. Am I right so far? You, you, it looks like a check kind of. It looks like a check kind of. A fifty dollar savings bond, and you keep that bond for five years, or three years, Probably longer. That's different times, ten years. Okay. A certain amount of time. Okay. <laughs> we got you. Why don't you. Why don't you run out and set the sundial so we'll be sure? But anyway. I'll retire to a madhouse. Anyway. I'll be there with you. <laughs> anyway. Once that time is up, then you get this certain amount that it stays. Well, like if you get a 20, if you purchase a $25 one, at the end of this certain time period, you can cash it out for like 75 bucks. So you earn money. You invested that money. So that's, that's what he's trying to get at. So if you bought a $25 one, you would have $75? After so many years. All right. Now listen. You you buy a $50 bond. Good almighty. This sounds like a board meeting at the bank. Uh, if you buy a $50 bond, you know, you give them $50. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, you can't do that with the U.S. government. Right. Yeah. Okay. You can't do that with the U.S. government. Right. Yeah. Okay. You can't do that with the U.S. government. Right. You're giving that to the U.S. government. You are loaning. Look, you're loaning your government money. And they keep your $50. Then they, well, they use it, but, you know, it takes... Five years, we'll say, or 10 years for your bond to mature. But when the five years is up, you go and you take your bond and say, I'd like to cash this bond in, and they pay you back $50. The U.S. government paid, because you loan the money, you pay the U.S. government $50. They pay it back to you with what? Interest. 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 So your $50 bond may be worth $65. I don't know what the rate is now, but $65. And, you know, if you bought 100 bonds and you haven't been there for 10 years, you stand to make a lot of money. At the same time, you're doing your, quote, patriotic duty. You are loaning your government money, and they pay that money back with interest. You understand that? Get this down. By and large, not entirely, get this down. By and large, World War I was financed with bonds. People bought bonds. If you went to the post office, there was a little table set up and there were people selling bonds. If you went to the movie theaters uh, out in the lobby, there were people behind tables selling bonds. You were encouraged to buy bonds. There were huge bond rallies. The most famous athletes, the most famous Hollywood actors went across the country and this guy would get up and say, I'm going to buy $5,000 worth of bonds today. I encourage you to buy bonds. And, you know, I mean, just think of... Um, Who's the quarterback? Brady. What's his name? Tom Brady. Well, think of you know, people like Tom. Think of Tom Brady. You know, was going to be here at the parking lot today at uh, 12 noon to sell bonds. Probably a few people would show up from all over the state, uh, thousands, and that's what they did. And they raised money, and people 
bought them and they financed the war through bonds. Just a minute. Yes. Do you have to like, buy bonds? You don't have it was completely voluntary. But people were encouraged to do it. And if you didn't do it, your neighbors sort of looked at you and said, hey, what's wrong with you? Don't you know we're fighting a war? Don't you support our troops? Don't you support the country? Okay, quickly here. Very quickly. Uh, well, write this down, and this is where we'll start. Uh, your test will go down to savings bonds, but write down civil liberties. Spell like that. Civil liberties during World War I suffered. Your civil liberties, get this down, are your constitutional rights. And what I'm saying to you is, is that people who didn't support the war many times had their civil liberties taken away from them, but we will take that story up after your test. All right. And by the way, here's another public service announcement. Next Wednesday is going to be, listen, next Wednesday is going to be, hold it just a minute. It's going to be, a virtual day. Isn't that true? Okay, I'm going to tape a lecture. I may do it the day before after school, or I made it, but, but you watch that. You're responsible for next Wednesday because you're going to take a test over it on Friday. Are we going to be out that Monday? I don't want, are we going to be out Monday? What is that? I heard about Easter. Oh, Easter. We're going to be out Friday. Yeah, we got to get some days off here. You all have been in school too much lately. We never go to school 10 days in a row without a break. Excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me.